All right, we've been uh, talking about some uh, very general patterns of uh, maritime trades and uh, a little bit about the vessels and equipment. Now, let's focus on some recent market developments. Uh, I do have a friend who used to be a director of something called Fernley Research in Oslo, which is doing market intelligence for the shipping industry and uh, they're selling their information at uh, incredible prices but uh, we've been allowed to use parts of their stuff in this presentation so this is something that you would normally have to pay f quite a lot for so let's see now it's al also on youtube so maybe i get punished um well okay um it's a bit varying. Some of the graphs are updated until 2011, some 2012, some 2013. Uh, sometimes some of this information uh, is a bit delayed. It takes time to, to, uh, to collect this worldwide. Now, this is the <coughs> market shares uh, of different products that are traded by sea. And you can see that it's uh, dominated by crude oil. 19%. <coughs> Coal and iron ore, which are dry bulks. Then you have something called minor bulks, a, a lot of different substances. Container transport, 15%. When you see a figure like this, presenting market shares, there is one important question that you need to, to ask. And that is on this screen. Quite often you will see pie charts like this without a very important element being defined, but it's defined here. So what should your question be when you see market shares presented in percentages like this? If you can answer this, then you're very clever. When you see market shares, what would you should your question be? Yeah, here it says based on tons traded. That's the key thing. Because you can see market shares like this presented at least based on two other statistics when it comes to, to shipping markets. Could you think of an alternative to tons traded as a basis for calculating market shares? The, the, value, traded. the value traded, very good. How would that, if this was based on value traded, how would that change the image? The big sectors here, how would they be different, you think? Which one would be more dominant than it is on this figure? If it was calculated by cargo value. Maybe chemicals would be higher than 2%. Mm -hmm. I agree. Other things that would be different? I think it would be higher because it would contain things like grain, food products, soybeans, compared to iron ore, coal, much more higher value. And there's one more sector that would definitely be bigger. Uh, oil and gas. No, not oil and gas. That's, that's fairly cheap by the tons. The container. the container business, definitely. Here it seems pretty small, but it's a very important trade and a much higher value commodity trade than the rest of these. Okay, so always ask the question when you see market shares and percentages, what is this based on? Is it value or is it tons? Or even in the shipping business, if you were a ship owner looking at which of these markets are creating most business, there could be a third statistic. Not tons and not value, but a third alternative that would be the best one representing the need for ships. Is that, is that yeah, well, volume could be an alternative, I agree, but it was not the one I was thinking about. Okay, if, you, if you're going to estimate the need for more ships to be built, what would you focus on then? Tons and volume is one part of it, but there is another element which is just as important. Type of 
Uh, yeah, well, we need the size of ships, but now we're talking about the cargo markets. Growth. Yeah, growth in what? In production. In and how do you measure production in shipping? No, but uh, in production of the things you are shipping, if the markets are okay. expanding, then you But that could be measured in tons and volumes. So that's the amount of cargo. But there is another element which is just as important for from a ship owner's point of view. The need for ships, shipping services, is also driven not only by the volume or the tons, but the distance, tra the average haul, as it's called. It matters whether you source these different things. So if you used to source the oil for the US market in the Middle East, which is a pretty long distance across the Atlantic, and now you switch to internal sources or Venezuela, which is much closer, there is a much smaller need for ships. So the best statistic, but it's also a hard one to obtain, would be ton miles. Combination of tons or volume and the distance. That's what we call transport work. Ton miles, transport work. <coughs> okay, oil consumption by area. We cannot pay attention to all details here, but there is uh, one important uh, characteristic that springs to mind. It's the red one here. Asia, in particular China, has uh, increased its oil consumption dramatically over the last decades. The others are more or less flat. Uh, this is the rest of the world. This is the former Soviet Union. So that was the consumption side. Here is the production side of oil. Uh, you can see that the Middle East, OPEC countries represented here, has a fairly volatile thing going up and down. And uh, the Middle East is called the marginal supplier, which means that if um, supplies are dropping somewhere else, the alternative would usually be to increase production in the Middle East. <coughs> there is one characteristic here which is in particular interesting, which is the development over the very last years, which we briefly mentioned in the last hour. Which is the most uh, interesting thing if you just look at the last five years in this figure? The trend has changed dramatically for one of these regions over the last years. The yellow line, North America, used to be flat or slightly declining. Now it's on an upswing because of this new shale oil and shale gas, new production technology for extracting oil and gas from rocks below the surface. Okay. Yeah, I think looking at the time we need to skip a few. So um, now if you look at uh, imports of oil from different regions of the world, you can see that Asia is the dominant importer of oil. The Europe uh, represented by EU here, North America and others. But if we focus on the Asian, the blue one, and subdivided into different countries, you will see that uh, China and India are the biggest ones, followed by Japan and Korea. And then looking at the exporting bit, uh, the Middle East could also be broken down. The Middle East is the dominant exporting region, uh, but you have different Arab countries uh, uh, here as well, Saudi Arabia being the biggest one. Okay, now this figure, or actually this is updated now, but uh, the, the similar figure for last year was actually in the exam paper in this class last year. And the question was, um, if I remember correctly, whether how this um, figure would uh, influence the shipping tanker market in the future. 
Um, there are a number of, uh, of terms here which we need to de define. Um, the, um, the figure represents the United States supply and exports of, of petroleum products. Uh, and it's a bit hard to read. It says down here, Canada crude. Um, products import, that means refined products that you import. This is the imports of crude oil from other countries to the US. And this is the US domestic production. So once again, this which we saw just as a small tendency on the, on the long term trend that we, we saw in the other graph. Here you can see the dramatic changes here. Um, although the last ones here are prognosis, um, this used to be the import side of crude oil in the US, peaked here somewhere in 2003, and has been on a very dramatic decline ever since. So if you were the owner of crude oil tankers, this is not a very positive scenario. The US is getting more or less self-supplied by oil, which means that they don't have to import oil from, for instance, the Middle East to the same degree as they have done. So this is what you might expect for the exam, to have such a graph and to try to interpret how this will affect the market. And it's this distance thing which is quite important also in figures like this, because if you um, if you import things from Canada to the US, it's usually going by pipelines or uh, very short transport distance. But if you import things from the Middle East, it generates a lot of demand for tanker transport. So it's a very different story. We had an incident a few years ago where they closed down the production in Venezuela uh, due to some political conflicts. And Venezuela is very close to the US market. So what happened then? Well, the US had to replace the Venezuelan oil with Middle East oil. And then you had a boom in the market in the demand for tanker capacity because of that. OK, some trends summing up the tanker market. Uh, we need, if you want to forecast this, to look at regional demand and regional stages of development. You've seen that. Uh, some of the Asian countries have had a very rapid development of their economies over the last years. And then the imports of oil follows that development. So you need to look at it from a regional perspective. Uh, in the longer run, environmental concerns about the use of, uh, of um, uh, oil products might influence these trades. We need to look at the mi energy mix in some regions. We mentioned the fact that some countries are building down their nuclear capacity. And that means that you will have some extra demand for some of these alternatives. Um, I didn't mention it, but in the, in for instance, in, uh, in the German market, renewables have now become a quite an important factor. The number of windmills being built, for instance, is now quite significant. OK, you look uh, at depletion of local resources or new production technologies. The US case is, uh, is a case of the latter. Uh, shale oil and gas uh, is a very good example of that. And then, of course, new trade routes and pipelines may influence the demand side. If they build a pipeline that replaces shipping services, of course, this is bad for the business. OK, yeah, I mentioned this. This is the offshore wind with some of the the windmills are out in the sea, and there are quite big developments here, in, uh, especially in the UK and in, in Germany. Um, OK. Now, there are a lot of details here which we will not look into. The main thing here is to look at how volatile the market is, because this, these are the freight rates, the, the price you have to pay for for uh, hiring vessels or for transporting cargo. And the main picture here is how volatile it is. It's very, very big differences from the peak markets to the bottom of the markets. The recent, most recent dramatic fall we had when the credit crunch or the credit crisis hit the markets in the autumn of 2008. 
You've all heard about the credit crunch or the credit crisis. This is how it affected the tanker market. Used to be in a situation where you had almost an all-time high of the freight rates, and then you went straight within a few weeks down to, to all-time low. Of course, it's very hard to survive in a market like this. And the, the fluctuations in shipping are much bigger than in the general uh, markets, which we will come back to. Even more dramatic in the dry bulk, the, this was the tanker market, this is the dry bulk market. Look at this drop here. This is the Baltic dry index, that's, a, that's sort of an index representing prices in the Baltic market, or in the dry bulk market. And, um, and you can see the fall here, which is uh, extreme. Uh, imagine if you're a ship owner and you're somewhere here, everything looks great, uh, you have very high cash flows coming in, you are ordering new vessels uh, because you have a lot of money coming in, you can afford new vessels. You go to the shipyard, everybody else is also experiencing the same thing, so everybody wants to build new vessels. What happens then? Well, it takes time to build a new vessel. From one year, if the market is slow, to almost four years when the markets are peaking. Let's say you order a new vessel here, and it takes three years before you have it delivered from the shipyard. Okay, one, two, three years ahead. This is the market the new vessel will hit. And of course, that adds to the problem. You have a lot of ordering, a lot of new capacity coming into a market which has dropped significantly. This is the reason why you have had many dramatic histories of bankruptcies in the shipping sector. Okay, uh, types of vessels. Uh, you can see that it's mainly the container vessels who are growing in numbers, and uh, in this case, uh, the total deadweight tonnage. General cargo, multipurpose, reefer, row row vessels, not more or less stable, but it's container business that is growing. But the rates for containers is also fluctuating quite a bit. Uh, and this is for different sizes of the dry bulk vessels. You can see that they follow pretty much each, each other uh, with the same peaks and troughs. So markets are pretty much linked. There could be some smaller deviations uh, where you have a specific situation pertaining to some of the ship sizes. Now, ships need to be registered in a nation, carrying a flag, as we call it. Here are the major fleet flags. Panama, Liberia, Marshall Islands, Hong Kong, Singapore, Greece. Uh, you can see what is the characteristics of, of these top ones? As nations, what is it that springs to mind? What kind of nations are these? Are they big nations? you register your vessel there, yeah. So this has been a, a trend over the last uh, 30 or 40 years that ship owners flag out, as we call it, to what you call flags of convenience. That's uh, a term that these nations don't like. They like the term open registries instead. But the reason for the flagging out is that these typically have l low cost regimes, low taxes, uh, uh, lower re requirements when it comes to the nationality of, uh, of the crew and so on. So the green ones here are sort of the, the traditional ship-owning nations in this chart and you can see that they are smaller. Greece is the biggest one, uh, still has a lot of vessels under its own flag but still much less than some of these others. If you look at it from a ship-owning point of view, who owns the vessels. You can see here the split between the national flag and the foreign flag. So the Greek ship owners 
they have, well, maybe one fourth of their vessels under the Greek flag, three quarters is under foreign flags. And you can see in Norway down the list, we have fallen. Uh, we used to be up here, number three or four, uh, but uh, it's diminishing. But here we are talking about the size of the vessel or the, the total size of the fleet. If this was calculated by the value of the vessels, Norway would be a bit higher because we have one of these offshore vessels, for instance, is just as valuable as a super tanker, but it's much smaller in size. Okay. Yeah, I think we'll skip the Norwegian picture now. Um, switching to one of the things I mentioned in the beginning of this lecture. Uh, the structure of the container market. Here, it's probably a bit small print for you, uh, but it, these are the 20 top container lines of the world. You can see Maersk line on the top here. Uh, the Danish operator is uh, the biggest one. Mediterranean Shipping Company based in Switzerland. CMI, CGM Group for France. These are the three biggest ones. Um, <coughs> When I gave a similar lecture last year, the situation was this. The three biggest ones wanted to form an alliance, something called the P3 alliance, saying that we want to cooperate, we want to share the capacity, and uh, then over the last year, this was seen as problematic. Why? Could it be problematic that these three top container operators says that they want to, to cooperate? They represent some 30% of the total world market. Why, why could that be problematic? Isn't it just a good thing that they cooperate? How could it be a problem? Exactly. It's about competition and competition policy, industrial organization, if you like. Um, even though they have some 30% of the world market, which is not a monopoly as such, they might have regional monopolies. They might be dominant in some of the trades. And this was the problem. I think they expected that the, most, the biggest problems would come from the European and the American competition authorities in approving this. But the one that actually stopped it was the Chinese competition authorities. Could you think about the reason this, this autumn? Uh, it shouldn't be an age term. Uh, uh, this spring, sorry, this spring should be in spring instead of autumn. 2014, the Chinese government said that they wouldn't accept this. Why, from a Chinese perspective, why would this be problematic? What is the interest of China here? Yes? Because of the local carriers, maybe? Could be. If you look down the, the line, you will find some Chinese operators. So that might be one reason, of course. That's not the official reason, or the, or the I think the main reason even. The main reason is China is very much living from its exports. If the transport of these export products becomes more expensive due to less competition, that would weaken the position of China versus its competition. So they said no, and it doesn't happen. So now they've formed a new strategy. Now the two top ones, they're leaving out the French operator, <laughs> and they are now proposing the APM or, or the Maersk, uh, and MSC is now proposing something called the 2M partnership, only the top ones. Um, and uh, um, th it still remains to see whether they will be allowed to do this. And then some of the other competitors have formed an alternative alliance called the Ocean 3. It's not exactly Ocean's 11, is it? But it is the French operator, a Chinese one, and uh, United Arab 
shipping company. So they are now trying to form two different alliances. It still remains to see whether this will be allowed. It's a smaller degree of concentration. But very much is happening on the international arena these days uh, regarding container shipping. Countries are worried, for instance the US, they are very much reliant upon an efficient container uh, industry for imports and exports and I don't want uh, competition to be lower. Okay, we need to skip a few of the market data. You can, can check out some of them yourselves, but this is the situation this spring. Uh, you can see the red ones here are the ships on order. The green one are the existing fleet. And you can see that there is a huge expansion of the biggest vessels planned. There are actually ordered almost as many ships as there are currently in the biggest category. So this means that you will have a big increase in the capacity. So the question is, and what everybody is worried about in the business, is whether there is a market for all this new capacity. Um, yeah. These are the orders of uh, new vessels. Here, Norway is actually on the top. That's because of all the uh, offshore supply vessels. <coughs> shipbuilding. Used to be a lot of shipbuilding in Europe, for instance. Now, most of it is in Asia. So you can see these three Asian countries are building most of the vessels. The only thing that's remaining in Europe, for instance, are the more advanced offshore vessels, the cruise vessels, a few of the container vessels are still being built in Europe. Okay, let's jump ahead. Um, a few words about the scrapping business. At the end of the lifetime of a vessel, a typical deep sea vessel would last or be operating for 15, 20, 25, maybe even 30 years, but eventually it will be scrapped. And um, this typically happens in, uh, under some pretty simple conditions in uh, a few Asian countries. They actually are on beaches where they on high tide run the ship aground on full speed and just strand them on the beach and then there's a lot of manual labor dismantling the vessels. Uh, these are the main countries involved in the scrapping business uh, and um, this is really, well, I don't have the, the pictures here but it's really problematic from an environmental point of view and safety point of view. Some of these shipyards there, are, there have been many fatalities and they are handling dangerous materials. So there is a convention on its way uh, internationally to try to regulate this and make ship owners more responsible for this part of the business. Now a lot of ship owners avoid this responsibility by selling the vessel before it's scrapped <coughs> to some trader, renaming it and so on, trying to get away from the responsibilities. Pretty dirty business. This is something that a lot of uh, Norwegian port managers are uh, interested in. Have you heard about the Northern <coughs> Sea Route? I mean, the tr this is a, a different way of looking at, at the world. Now Norway is down here, um, Siberia here. Uh, if you, the normal trade route from China, which would be somewhere outside the map here, would be all the way through the US and to Europe it takes uh, uh, four or five uh, weeks. If you can go to <coughs> the polar areas, either one or the other way, uh, you could probably save one to two weeks. They have tried it with a number of vessels and there are some challenges related to that, but um, uh, the ice is melting very fast in the North Pole area, uh, so this is uh, something that probably will happen uh, on which scale uh, we don't know yet but the trade flows from Asia to Europe might switch to the northern sea route uh, in a few years okay the vol we have seen that the volatility of the shipping market is very high and it is actually much higher than the stock market this is partly due to the fact that uh, the supply side is not very flexible. You have a limited number of vessels and it takes very long time to build a new vessel. 
that means that uh, the, the supply side is moving very slowly. So if you have a dramatic change in the demand side, you're not able to adjust the supply side as quickly. This is one of the main reasons for the very high peaks and troughs of the markets in shipping. We have seen that the credit crunch or the, the financial crisis in 2008 hit the shipping markets very hard and they've not been able to recover since. Slight upturn though, but, but not dramatically. Um, and we've seen that in the container market there are some big initiatives to, to, uh, to form alliances and have what we call further market consolidation. Uh, the question is whether it will be accepted by the authorities. Okay, the last uh, minutes of this lecture we'll have a brief look at international shipping policies. Uh, that's a big area uh, that we could spend many lectures on, but this will just be a glimpse then. Now, the key challenge here is that this is a truly globalized industry. If we only took a national perspective on the regulations here, saying, for instance, from a Norwegian perspective, that all ships should comply with this and that uh, environmental standard. Like you do in Europe with engines of trucks, you have different standards and saying that uh, all new trucks built in Europe now should comply with Euro 6 standards. If you did the same thing from a Norwegian perspective, or even from a no uh, European perspective in shipping, what would happen? well, they would just flag out all the vessels out of Europe. And there is no way we can control it from a national point of view, even from a regional point of view. So we need global regulations in order to regulate such a global business. The key players here are the ship owners, the port states, the flag states, the registries, and something called the classification societies. Classification societies are the quality assurers of the shipping business. The biggest one in the world is now a merger between the Norwegian and the German one, DNV GL, Norske Veritas and, and Germanisch Lloyd. Okay. Yeah, the history, I think we'll drop that and we definitely do not have time for another brainstorming, so let's skip those. The problem with national regulations, as I said, is that they may be evaded. It's possible to escape them. Different nations uh, and national regulations will also uh, cause inefficiencies, meaning that you will have, if you had different regulations in Europe and the US, for instance, the same vessel would, could not be used in both markets, which is inefficient. So it's necessarily global standards to avoid what we could call a race to the bottom, meaning that we just open up a free market and you can, uh, can uh, operate vessels with a very poor standard uh, anywhere. So we need global regulations. There are some important international organizations related to this regulatory framework. We will mainly focus on what's done by the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, which is part of the UN system. If you want to study these things, they have a pretty good website, imo.org. But there are a number of other bodies related to other elements as well. But we'll focus on safety, security and environment, which belongs to that one. Okay, we Flags of convenience was mentioned here. Very low taxing uh, uh, environments and so on. So we see that most ships now are registered under these open registries. Now, this has been a controversial development and it particularly the workers' federations represented by ITF, for instance, um, has been critical against this, and they have done studies which conclude that these flags of convenience have problematic sides with respect to worker safety and worker uh, environment. And they published, uh, for instance, a report on this called the Black Sea of Shame. Yeah, I think we'll drop the, 
market access general bit just to show one case of where the market has not been deregulated. I think we most of us think about the United States as the promoter of free and open competition, but it's not so with respect to shipping. They're the most protectionistic country when it comes to shipping at all. They have something called the Jones Act, which is uh, officially called uh, the Merchant Marine Act, back from the 1920s. And this state is not arbitrary. It follows the World War I. And the reason is that during World War I, the US had a big problem supplying everything they needed because they found out that they didn't own many vessels. They didn't control many vessels. So they formed a new act which reserved a lot of the trades within the US for US-owned, manned, built, managed, registered vessels. So it's not possible. If you are a ship owner from South America or from Europe, you cannot take cargo between um, New York and Houston. It's not possible. It's not allowed. But you can take cargo from Europe to the US. So it's the domestic market. All government cargoes are also reserved for US flag. Alaskan oil is reserved for US flag. So this is a pretty strict regulation. We do not have time to look into the details. You will have to, to have a look at this and um, how the IMO works. They are the typical way new regulations come about is that you have some sort of an incident, something happening. For instance, an oil spill or something like that. You will promote uh, a new regulation to the IMO and they will have committees working on this and then all the nations involved in shipping need to, to implement these things. One example is the Marine Pollution Act, uh, which regulates First of all, it started uh, focusing on uh, pollution to the sea. Now the latest amendments is focusing on emissions to air. So um, this has started to come into play. There will be a major, if we look at this one, a major tightening of the demands just a few months from now in something that we call this special environmental control areas. These are the blue areas of the world and you can see that we are living Maldives exactly there where the end of one of these environmental control areas are. So the first ones where you had stricter emissions controls were the North Sea, the Baltic Sea and the English Channel. Eventually we have also f uh, the east, east coast of North America and, and the west coast has been implemented. And there you will have a very much stricter regime when it comes to uh, sulfur emission. And you can see that uh, by 2015, uh, three or four months, three months from now, the, the demands of the sulf sulfur content in the fuel will be much stricter. The same goes for NOx, but that's regulated through engine demands on the engine, there will be a very strict, much stricter regulation coming from next new year on. Okay. There are a lot of remaining challenges. I mentioned, for instance, the ship recycling problem. Uh, this has been dealt with through something called the Hong Kong Convention. Uh, but it takes incredibly long time to get it into force. Uh, as far as I know, it's still only Norway who has ratified this convention. It, we need some 15 of the biggest uh, marine nations in the world to underwrite to this in order for it to come into effect. You need 40% of the shipping, ship owning nations uh, to, to uh, sign to it in order for it to become effective. And that could take years and decades. In some cases, it has been a pretty fast process. These are some of the remaining challenges which has not been dealt with very well at this time. Regulating CO2 emissions is uh, part of this. There is a regime for new demands on marine engines, but it's not very strict at the moment. Okay. 
some of the regulations are focusing on the safety of the sailors and so on, and uh, you will have to look at this your on your own. We mentioned the piracy problem. It's not only the Bay of Aden, which is uh, outside the Suez Canal or, or uh, uh, east of uh, northeast Africa. Um, but um, uh, this was a major problem with hijacking of, uh, of vessels where the crew has been taken hostage and so on. Uh, the problem has very much declined last year and from now on, partly probably due to uh, military surveillance uh, and uh, the fact that quite a lot of the vessels have hired their own gunmen to, uh, to protect the vessels. Okay, we'll have to drop a few of the cases here and come to... I mentioned these fences which came after September 11. I would like to... Well, let's focus part of the, res uh, the uh, responsibility for checking the quality of vessels belongs with the flag state, but increasingly the port state control regime has become more important. And here is an example of that. In Europe, the port state control regime is called the Paris Memorandum of Understanding. Um, what this means is that all the ports in Europe cooperate in controlling vessels and exchanging information about inspections and so on. So it means that if one uh, ship is uh, found not seaworthy, in one of the ports, a message goes to all the other parts of Europe and it will be banned from those ports until things have been rectified. So it's a much more efficient system than we used to have, where uh, vessels who, who were found problematic in one port could just go to a, a neighbor port and do its business there. Now this is a, a much more regulated thing. And you can see that uh, the Paris Memorandum of Understanding presents on its web pages some uh, blacklists of flags. So vessels uh, belonging to these flags will be identified as very high risk, high risk, medium to high and so on. That means that they would either be, some of them would be banned at all from European ports, some of them will have much more frequent inspections than others. Okay. You can read a couple of these slides here. You have similar things in other parts of the world. In Asia, you have the K Tokyo Protocol. There is one for Latin America and so on. And they pretty much work the same way. If you want to have a look at how this works, you can uh, go into a database called Equasis, which is open to anyone. And you can actually go in there and check a specific vessel, whether how it's performed and whether it's been uh, Problematic. Here is an example from, from this database uh, where you have one specific vessel and it says uh, um, the, a lot of statistics about uh, the vessel, where it belongs and so on. And here, uh, um, when the ship is detained, held back, it's not allowed to leave the port until certain things have been fixed. Here, in this case, in 2010 in Marseille, it was held back for three days. There were 13 things that they needed to fix. Here are a few of the things that was mainly related to corrosion which and cracks which they had to fix. Okay, yeah, there are more examples of from that database here that you can study on your own. Okay, so the marine safety regime is comprising all these different actors. Flag states have some responsibilities, classification societies, ship owners, and the port states. Yeah, I've added too much here, but let's take the summary bit to end with. Now, we have seen that global regulations are necessary to cope with an international business. Um, we've uh, seen some of the focal areas. They are environmental aspects, there are safety aspects, there are security aspects. Safety mainly dealing with the safety of the sailors, security with piracy, anti-terrorism and so on. 
port state control regime has become more important and we now have new stricter regulations coming especially in these environmental control areas when it comes to emissions to air from ships but there are many remaining issues and I would say that the CO2 issue is probably the most important one that's it thank you so much I will upload the presentation on Frontier